seconds away on Studio 5. The word tells us that if any two of us shall agree on anything on earth, that God will do it for us. James Fortune went from Grammy-nominated singer to jail time. We're five days in jail for you, Minister of Music, like. And for the first time, he's opening up about domestic violence and the road to healing. This was something that was difficult for me because... <laughs> Plus, meet a worship leader with a heart to train children to take his place. Could we actually create something where we'd raise up these young worshipers and these young worship leaders who would eventually then go over into our worship teams and help lead worship on Sunday mornings? And get your first glimpse. Heavenly Father, we come to thank you for your word and your will. Of the film that took top honors at the Sundance Film Festival. Studio 5 starts now. That's music from gospel recording artist James Fortune. Welcome to Studio 5. James Fortune is famous for his award-winning singing and songwriting. But earlier this year, he made headlines for charges of domestic violence. We're going to sit down with him for a candid conversation right here in his hometown of Houston, Texas in just a bit. But first, let's take a look at the rundown for this week's uplifting entertainment news. It is your Studio 5 Top 5. At number five, Christina Grimmie. Fans mourning the singer who was shot in Orlando are petitioning Nintendo to name a character in the next Legend of Zelda game after her. <laughs> Grimmie was a big fan of the game. A Nintendo spokesperson told Time Magazine it has acknowledged the ongoing petitions, but is delaying any definite decisions, allowing time for family and friends to continue to mourn her death. On to a not so usual number four. A chance meeting at this Memphis grocery store isn't just entertaining, it's heartwarming. You could tell he didn't have anything. And he was asking to work to get some food, you know, and I, it just broke my heart. A child offered to carry Matt White's bags for a bag of donuts. Turns out the boy's mom is too sick to work and they're homeless. I couldn't do what he did at 16 years old. I couldn't go out and earn keep for my mom like he did. He just makes me humble. The humility led Matt to raise a quarter of a million dollars online. You're going to be able to get a house. A nice house is going to be yours. I, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. I don't, you know, Thompson told, told me not to cry, but I don't know. I might break down in tears. Mom and son have already moved in. Easy, easy as one, two, three. At number three, preachers can talk. I got a tweet this morning asking me if looking at porn was cheating. And the Fox Network is just days away from its summer test run of the talk show, starring four popular megachurch pastors and produced by one of the creators of The View. Is Beyonce a role model or not? Catch the answer when The Preachers begins July 11th. That brings us to number two, with the free state of Jones. Mr. Moses, what are you? Free man, Captain. Why's that? Because you cannot own a child of God. Matthew McConaughey plays a Mississippi man who led farmers and slaves in a resistance against the Confederacy. It's based on the real life man who McConaughey says was grounded in scripture. Led by this man, Newt Knight, who I also had never heard about, who had such a clear identity of what was right and what was wrong. And drum roll to number one. You a child of God. You got purpose. The law put it there, then nobody can take it away. A first look at another true story. A slave and preacher who led a rebellion against slave owners in 1831. 
I lead you to Peter 218. Submit yourselves to your masters. Filmmaker Nate Parker also stars as Nat Turner in Birth of a Nation, which hits theaters in October. The Lord spoken to me. Visions of what's to come. And that is this week's top five from Studio Five. Flashback to 2012 and James Fortune found himself being celebrated, nominated for two Grammy Awards, Best Gospel Album of the Year and Best Gospel Song of the Year. Just two years later, the Billboard chart-topping artist found himself in jail, arrested on charges of domestic violence. Well, earlier this year, here in a Houston courtroom, the punishment for that crime played out, and so did the headlines. James Fortune is speaking out for the very first time and he is this week's Studio 5 interview. Hey, so hold on. Yes. James Fortune's music has topped the gospel charts for more than a decade. Ministry was my life. You know, it's all I've known. I started playing the drums at five years old. Fortune is a preacher's kid from Houston, Texas. He's recorded seven albums, earned two Grammy nominations, and performed for packed crowds around the world. But in March, this singer and songwriter traded those venues guilty. for this courtroom where he pleaded guilty to assaulting his wife. You've been given five years probation. Yeah. Spent five days in jail. Yes. What were five days in jail for you, Minister of Music, like? It was rough. I had a lot of time to just think. I, I've sung in so many prisons, I've ministered in prisons. You know, we've gone to prisons and, I mean, maximum security prisons and shared the gospel and ministered. And now, you know, here I am as, as, a, as a, an inmate myself. And you did 175 hours community service? Yeah, I'm, well, I'm still doing it. Still them. doing that? Yeah. I'm and what does that involve? Whatever the city needs, picking up trash, cutting grass. It's, it's, not, it's not just chilling, I'll tell you. It's <laughs> not, I mean, you're right, it's Texas, it's Houston in the heat, so. James and his wife, Cheryl, are legally separated and can have no contact for the next five years. She isn't speaking publicly, but issued this statement to him in court. I hope in all of this you get help, serious help. Although this probation might be like a slap on the wrist, I hope you look at it as a moment to better yourself and change something within you for your future. There are reports that you threw her against a wall, hit her with a stool, threw her out of the house, were there any broken bones? There were no broken bones. There were no internal injuries. There was no broken pelvis. Those reports were false. Um, her being beat with a stool was, was false. Mm -hmm. um, now, you know, like I said, I did put my hands on her. I did um, physically uh, restrain her and remove her from my room. This was something that was difficult for me because a lot of people were saying, you know, don't talk about it, you know, just kind of just let it, let it go and, you know, let people forget about it, hopefully, and move on with your life. But as I was praying, it's my spirit that didn't sit well with me. And God was like, I want you to share your story because domestic violence is something that the church doesn't talk about. And so I'm basically stretching out saying, you know what, I was a perpetrator of a, uh, domestic violence. I was an abuser in more ways than one. Instead of just believing and praying, James is fully involved in the healing. Since the 2014 assault, he has been in therapy and allowed our cameras to follow him to a meeting. I've learned a lot more now since I've been in therapy um, for almost 18 months. Uh, I thought domestic violence was just, you know, if, if you hit your wife or if you you know, slap your wife, but I found out there's so many, there's 18 forms of abuse and only one of them is physical. So I, it didn't start with physical. Um, that night, that's what caused me to be arrested, obviously. Um, but there was other forms of, of, of uh, abuse that I was a perpetrator of. You're certainly not a victim in this, but what all have you lost as a result? You can't even put a number on it, you know, because even now there's so many churches who just don't want to, um, don't want me in their church. You know, they don't want to have anything to do with um, with my ministry. Um, a lot of concerts were canceled. And who knows, just the, the, the concerts that were, were potentially there that people say, you know what, no, we can't, um, we can't have anything to do with that name. Um, but that, that hasn't been my focus. You were suicidal? I, I, I started off taking antidepressants just to help me sleep because I hadn't been getting any sleep um, for days upon days. Uh, so I was taking them to basically just get some rest. And I started uh, just feeling so guilty for what I had did, bad choices that I had made in my life. So you have a bottle of pills that you're thinking I'm going to take and just end it all. Yeah. What stops you? Um, people were praying for me. So many people 
uh, were letting, letting me know that, James, you know, it's not over. It's not the end. Uh, many pastors, uh, many Christian leaders around the, around the country and around the world uh, were reaching out to me. But you get to a point to where you're like, you know what, I don't even deserve forgiveness. I'm out of the reach of grace. For me personally, it was remembering even my grandmother's prayers, you know, praying for me as a, as a, as a boy. And, and God kind of told me something. He said, James, prayers don't expire. What's been the most difficult part? For me, the most difficult part is um, the separation, you know, um, from my family, mm. um, you know, even my children, you know, to not know exactly why um, their father is not around as much as he used to be. And trying to explain that to them and let them know that, you know, I, I just made a horrible choice. Fortune spent six months separated from his four children. Oh, did he get it? These days, he's with them at least once a week. James Fortune isn't ready to return to the recording studio full time just yet, but he is still writing music. He'll share the story of a song that was birthed in this dark time in his life when the Studio 5 interview continues. Also to come on Studio 5. Worship simply is our, our response to who God is. A worship leader issues a call for the church to unite. And he's starting young. James Fortune has shared with us that some bad decisions in life cost him dearly. In fact, at one point he was ready to take his own life, commit suicide, right here in the city of Houston. But one thing he says saved his life, prayer. That reality gave birth to a song. And that's where we pick up our conversation in part two of this Studio 5 interview. I know how God's able to, to take you out of what you thought was your most traumatic and, and difficult season and birth something out of that that just totally blows your mind. Has God birthed music out of you in this season? Yeah, that's that's been there a lot of therapy for me as well. Just writing, you know, I'm a writer. I'm a songwriter. I'm a uh, so I've written so many songs through this journey. That includes this Thank one. You. Prayer saved my life. This one's personal. Have you ever needed someone when you were going to encourage you? posted on social media, please pray that during this process, God continues to perfect and restore me so that I'll become a better man, father, and Christian. Yeah. What's this process been like? I'm going to be honest. The process has been very, very um, beyond my expectations. My eyes have been open. Yeah, it started out rough. Yeah, I was suicidal and didn't think I had anything to live for. Didn't think my life had any more purpose. I'm like, you know, uh, it's, it's over. But to see how God just is able to keep me every day. I just kept going to sleep and waking up, just kept going to sleep and waking up, believing that change was gonna come. As I've shared, I share with other people what God has been doing through my life. So many other people are reaching out, and a lot of men are reaching out, but so many women are saying, you know what, we always hear the victims talk, uh, but we never hear the perpetrators speak Absolutely. about where, where this comes from and why this happens and, and how it's not their fault. So the process has been something that I would say was, was necessary. I can remember as a boy walking in on my grandmother and she'd be on her knees interceding for her family. Thank you for loving me. That song, Prayer Saved My Life, is available online free of charge. And still to come on Studio 5. Miss Clara, you like your coffee room temperature? No, baby, mine's hot. Sitting down with another preacher's kid, Bible teacher and actress to talk more about prayer. For every visible, physical um, event that we see happen in our lives, whether positive or negative, there is a spiritual counterpart that we cannot see. And that's the beauty of Houston in time lapse. Welcome back to Studio 5, coming to you this week from Houston, Texas. And as we can see here in our visit to James Fortune's home, school is out for the summer. 
Summer also means camps are in session. And worship pastor Cliff Lambert has a unique summer experience to teach children to come together and worship and ultimately unite the church. What we've been focusing on is the things that that are that are different about us rather than th the things that unite us and the things that we can agree on. Let your kingdom come on earth. Unity, I think, is what Christ wants for all of us as the body of Christ and as the church. I feel like he came to live and to die for all of us. And I think it probably hurts hurts his heart a little bit when he sees the division that has risen because of the differences. When our country and the world can see the church coming together, um, I think that just um, gives us more power. I feel like the Holy Spirit can really use that to, to help us make a difference in our, in our culture. Cliff Lambert is part of the Hampton Roads Worship Collective, a collaboration of leaders working to unify the church. Right now we have probably close to 50 or 60 churches come together and through that we've been able to offer some really fantastic nights of worship where you see leaders and churches from all different denominations and backgrounds coming together to lift up the name of Jesus in our city. Denomination didn't matter, what church you went to didn't matter, um, but the fact that you were a believer in Jesus and you wanted to worship Him, you could come to this event and feel like you could do that freely. And it was just a beautiful picture of seeing the church come together. And the events are growing, most recently filling the seats of a sports complex to spend one night with the King. We had over 30 worship leaders from the area come together um, and provide just two and a half hours of, of worship. Um, and, and the estimate is that we had probably close to 2,000 people attend that event. And this summer, the group launches Unite Worship Camp after asking, could we actually create something where we'd raise up these young worshipers and these young worship leaders who would eventually then go over into our worship teams and help lead worship on Sunday morning. We're working with um, area worship leaders and a local college and we're going to be having a three-day worship camp where worship leaders from the area are going to be the breakout session teachers for that and we're going to provide times of worship but we're also going to offer training for 14 to 18 year old students in leading worship, stage presence, um, keyboard, guitar, uh, drums, all of that and help them to learn how to worship and lead worship from behind an instrument or as a vocalist on a worship team. So you're not just giving them musical training, but you're also helping, helping them to understand what is worship all about. Along with the training, the camp includes meals every day and dorms for the students for both nights, all for just $75. If you were to go to one of these clinics somewhere else in the country, you'd spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars for this kind of training. Uh, but this is a three-day camp where you actually get to spend um, two nights on, the co on a college campus um, uh, for, for very, very little money. Cliff hopes to see other churches follow the worship collective's lead and go outside of their walls. I think too often we think of the church as individual buildings, which I think is wonderful, but I think when we think of God's view of the church, I think he thinks of it as the bride of Christ, of those that have put their faith in Jesus Christ, who understand that he died, rose again for our sins, and that those who repent and put their trust in Him are saved for eternity. And truly understand what it means to worship. Worship simply is our, our response to who God is. We come to worship because we want to be revitalized, we want to be refreshed, we want to be encouraged, we want to be inspired. But when we approach worship that way, what does it become? It becomes about us, doesn't it? When I think of worship, my I think of complete surrender to God. I mean, and, and, and just to be in awe of who He is. I truly believe that, you know, when God reveals Himself, we respond to that revelation. If you look in Isaiah, God revealed Himself to Isaiah. The, the temple was filled with smoke, and what was Isaiah's response? He fell to the ground and he said, Woe is me, I am undone, for I am a man of unclean lips. And then he said, here I, here I am, send me. We need to understand that worship is giving, it's offering, it's surrendering. 
And I think when we do that, God can use that in a powerful and mighty way. Through that, he then encourages us and inspires us. Still to come on Studio 5. It's time for you to fight for your marriage. The actress who starred in a film about prayer has a fresh word about its power. And we are just about out of time for this show, but the work never stops to bring you good, uplifting entertainment news. Let's take a look at what we're working on for next week. He goes by one name, but he's a triple threat. Doing memorable work is all I have asked for. I'm sitting down with Leon, the singer, songwriter, and actor, shares his journey to stardom in Studio 5. And that is just one story from next week's rundown. As for today's show, I'm giving the final word to another inspiring Texan. You've heard James Fortune talk about the power of prayer. Well, Bible teacher and actress Priscilla Shire has a message about the undeniable power of getting on your knees. Paul mapped out for us in Ephesians chapter 6 this spiritual armor. He's like, if, if you have this on, you will be victorious. You know, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit and on and on. And most of the time we stop at those six pieces of armor. But right at the tail end of that, he says over two verses, more, more biblical real estate than the other pieces of armor. He says, pray, pray at all times in the spirit on every occasion for all the believers. He goes on and on and on about prayer as if to say, this is the seventh weapon. And this seventh weapon is the one really that infuses the other six with the power that they need to actually be, effect, uh, be um, effective in battle. So uh, more than anything, I, I think that the Lord is trying to remind his people that if you'll just pray, I will hear, I will heal the land. Prayer is the key he has given us to unlock all the power of heaven so that he can, he's just waiting to release it, but somebody's got to use the key. Prayer is no doubt part of your armor and you should never go to war or battle without it. That is the final word for this edition of Studio 5 coming to you from Houston, Texas. Until next time, reach out and touch me at Ephraim Graham on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And then come on back and see where Studio 5 takes you next week. Bye-bye.